Hello. Today I will be talking about the game Chaos in the Old World. This came out, I believe, in 2009, which is probably around the same time I, inquire, <laughs> I acquired it. Um, I had last played it with uh, other people all the way back in 2012, so it had been quite a while. But I pulled it out the other day and just played it solo to refresh myself on the rules and thought I'd go ahead and do a video on it. So let's get started with setup. So, as usual, um, first thing you do is put the game board in the middle of the table uh, where all players can reach it. The game board has these threat dials for the various uh, powers um, that the players will be playing. So you'll make sure that each one is set to the start setting. So you've got Corn, Nurgle, Zinch, and Slanish. Then each player will choose uh, one power sheet depending on which um, of the uh, ruinous powers or gods that they want to play. Um, Corn, Zinch, Nurgle, or Slanish. Um, you can do that by consensus, or if nobody can decide, you uh, randomly uh, distribute one to each player. If you're playing with three players instead of four, then you'll return one uh, of the power sheets to the box. Once you've decided um, who's going to be what, you have to go in a certain order. So the corn player will always be followed by the Nurgle player, which will be followed by the Zinch player. I mean the Zinch player, and then finally the Slanish player, uh, which is the same order that the threat dials are in, Corn, Nurgle, Zinch, Slanish. So you'll want to sit around the table probably in that order, or at least remember that's the order that players will take their turns. You'll then give each player their power marker, which they'll put on the highlighted uh, number on their power track there. Give each player their corresponding victory point marker, which they will put on the zero space of the victory point track on the board. Give each player their corresponding corruption tokens that match the symbol on their uh, power sheet. Give each player their deck of corruption cards that again uh, goes along with their power sheet. The symbol matches what's on their power sheet. Each player will also get uh, their deck of five upgrade cards, again corresponding to the power they've chosen. Finally, each power will get the plastic figures that go along with their faction. Each faction's cultist figures look the same but their warrior figures and greater daemon figures look different and they each have different names so on the bottom of the sheet here you can see they're all uh, for each of the powers they're cultist warrior and greater daemon but they have different names and can be referred to these names by uh, cards and that kind of thing so the cultists for the corn faction here are called blood sworn their warriors are blood letters, and their greater daemon is a bloodthirster. Whereas for Zinch, you can see that their cultists are called acolytes, their warriors are called whores, <clears throat> and their greater daemon is called the Lord of, Lord of Change. And you can see here's his, their Zinch's greater daemon, or demon, and uh, this is their warrior figure. And they have a different a, a number of figures. You can see here that, for instance, that Zinch only has three warrior figures, but has eight cultist figures. Whereas Korn here has six uh, warrior figures and only four cultist figures. So I'm setting up for a three-player game. So I've got Corn, uh, Nurgle, and Zinch. For each power, the rules suggest you take the unused um, upgrade cards, which at the beginning of the game they're all unused, 
and tuck them all under the left side of your <laughs> power sheet to know that the so that signifies that uh, you don't have those upgrades currently but you could just set them to the side or mark them however you want that uh, you don't currently have those uh, upgrades next you take your various tokens uh, old world old world tokens and dial advancement tokens and place them uh, somewhere near the board I just have mine in these uh, token holders here <laughs> and I just knock Corn's Greater Daemon over but anyway just place them somewhere near the board where all players can reach them also set your dice somewhere near the board where all players can reach them next you'll take your five ruination cards and make sure they're sorted with numbers one two three four five you can see in the upper left hand corner there five being on the bottom one being on the top and uh, put them in the ruination card space on the game board you'll take your old world deck which has this back and shuffle it you'll then deal out cards into a stack depending on the number of players seven cards for a four player game and eight cards for a three player game I'm playing an eight player or a four four player game so I'll be dealing eight cards and those will form your old world deck so you'll put them here on the board where it says old world deck the rest of your old world cards will not be used so you can just put them back in the box or off to the side then from your old world tokens you'll take two noble tokens which are these three warp stone tokens which are these and four peasant tokens which are these You'll then, from some method, uh, mix them up, draw them from a cup or from uh, player's hands or however you want to do it so they're randomly distributed, one in each uh, of the regions on the board. The regions are divided by these lines, as you can see here. So let me get that done. So I've got those distributed in the nine regions of the board. Got a noble token in Norska, a warpstorm token in Troll Country, a peasant in Kislev, a noble token in the Empire, a peasant token in Bretonia, a warpstorm token in Estalia, a warpstorm token in Tilia, a peasant token in the Border Princes, and finally a peasant token in the Badlands. Each player will then shuffle his Chaos deck and draw three cards from it to form his starting hand. So I've done that for each of my players. There's their starting hand of cards. Of course, they would be in their hands where the other players couldn't see them instead of just laid out on the table, but that's what you got to do when you're trying to film a video and playing by yourself. And that complete setup. We're all ready to go so let's get started with how to play alright so how do we play well the game is played in six phases uh, um, the game is played in rounds each round consisting of six phases there's the old world phase draw phase summoning phase battle phase corruption phase and end phase and each of these power sheets um, has that on the round sequence so it's a pretty good player aid it doesn't have all exactly all the details of how each of these favorite phases work but it's pretty good and then it also tells what each of the uh, old world, world tokens are so they're pretty helpful so the first thing you can see is the old world phase so in that phase the player with the lowest threat and threat is determined by these dials up here so you can see that Corn uh, has a threat of three, Nurgle has a threat of one, and Zeech has a threat of two. We're not using Slanish, so the lowest threat is Nurgle. So the, the player with the lowest threat 
which is the Nurgle player here currently, will draw one Old World card and basically resolve it. So this one, <clears throat> he'll read the text, remove all event tokens from the board, and remove any Old World card bearing the twin-tailed comet icon, like this. So if pre, so if this card was drawn later in the game and there were a, was another uh, Old World card with this twin-tailed uh, comet icon on it they would be it would be removed from the old world track here and if there were any event tokens currently on the board um, which are these they would be removed from the board because that's what it says to do but since this is the first card of the game there aren't any currently on the board nor any cards to be removed so then we go to this part where it says then place one event token in any region. So this player, the Nurgle player, gets to decide where to place this event token, and he might want to read what the event is going to do. So in the end phase, when old world cards are resolved, remove all cultists from every region containing at least one event token. Then move all event tokens in play to the region with the most corruption tokens. So it's going to remove cultists so he doesn't really know where those are right now, so we'll just say he's going to choose this one at random to put that uh, event token. And then this card will be placed in the first space of the Old World track. If there was a card currently here, it would be shifted to this spot. And if there was a card on this spot, it would be removed from the game. So we'll just place this one here. All right, so that was pretty easy old world phase um, on the first round of the game. All right, next we go to the draw phase. Now each player's power sheet tells them how they draw cards. So Corn he gets to draw two chaos cards, so he'll draw two more into his hand. There is no hand limit for any of the powers. Uh, Zinch here, his is a little different. It says draw until you have five chaos cards. Um, if you wish, discard one first. So he's not going to discard one, but he's going to draw two. That'll give him five. And then Nurgle is the same as Corn, just draw two Chaos cards. So he'll draw two into his hand. He or she. Okay, also in the draw phase, and it won't matter um, at the first turn of the game, but uh, starting from the second turn of the game on, each player's uh, power marker will be down all the way in the zero space of their power track. So in the draw phase, you move it back up to the highlighted space on the track. Or you may have um, some game effect that lets you go further than that. But uh, if not, it goes to the highlighted space on your power track. Alright, that's the draw phase. Next we have the summoning phase. Um, in the summoning phase, players will take turns, um, starting with Corn, then going to Nurgle, then uh, Zinch, and then Slanish if he was in play. Um, so each player will take a turn. On their turn, they can either summon a figure um, to the board, paying its summoning cost. You can see here the summoning cost for a cultist is one power. Summoning cost for a warrior is two power. And summoning cost for a greater daemon is three power. That's the number in that circle. Now that may be different, um, for instance, for Nurgle. Uh, it only costs him one uh, power to summon a warrior, whereas it costs two power to summon a uh, warrior for Zinch and for uh, Corn. So each player will take a turn either uh, playing a card from their hand or summoning a figure. Then, uh, you know, so Corn will go first. He'll do one of those, then Nurgle, then Zinch, then back to Corn. And they can, and it'll keep going that way, each player taking a turn until they have no power left or until they don't want to do something once a player, even if they have power left but they don't want to summon or play a card. Um, then they basically pass and they have to move their marker down to the zero and then uh, they're skipped until everybody is out of power and then that will end the rounds. So uh, let's get a, an example of summoning. So 
uh, it's, say it's Korn's turn and he wants to summon a cultist. It costs one power, so he would move his power marker down one. And then when you have no figures on the board, you can summon uh, your figure into any of the nine regions. So maybe he wants to summon it here uh, to the Empire. However, now once you have at least one figure on the board, any future figures that you summon must be summoned into the same region or an adjacent region. And adjacent regions are uh, regions that share a border. So for instance, the Empire here shares a border with Bretonia, with the border princes, and with Kislev. Um, so if he were to summon a figure um, into a different region, it could, it would, could only be one of those. He couldn't sum it over here into Astelia because he doesn't currently have a figure adjacent to that. So again, um, when you have no figures on the board, you can summon a figure into any of the nine regions. But once you have at least one figure in the board, um, any future... <laughs> there was Alexa. Um, any future uh, summons that you do must be to a region you currently have a figure in or uh, a region that's adjacent to um, somewhere that you already have a figure in. You can summon a figure that is already on the board if you wish. Um, so that's basically moving it. So moving it is the same thing as summoning it. So if if Korn wanted to summon this figure from the Empire to Bretonia, he could do that um, because even though he's going to be removing that figure, it's currently adjacent when he does the summon. So he could summon it for one power and move it to Bretonia. Even though he doesn't have a figure there, he did have one that was adjacent so he could summon it there. Okay, so besides summoning a figure to the board, the other thing you can do is play a card. And this is the cost um, shown here on the cards you have in your hand. So those cost one power to play. That one costs zero power to play. Um, this one costs two power to play. You'll see each region has two spaces where a card can be played into that region. So once those two spaces are filled in that region, you couldn't play another card into that um, region. So when you play a card, so if you wanted to, on your turn, you decided you were going to play this card, you know, here into Astalia. That costs one power. You would move your power marker down one. And then the card will either have an effect that takes place immediately or maybe sometime in the future. For this one it says, no other, no figures other than yours may be summoned away from this region while this card remains here. So you may want to, you probably wouldn't want to play that into an empty region, but you might want to play that into a region that has a bunch of opponent's figures into it that you don't want them to be able to move. If two players have cards in a region, or there's two cards in a region whose effects would uh, take place uh, simultaneously, then the left-hand card is always resolved before the right-hand card. So those are the things you can do in the summoning phase. You can either summon a figure, um, one of your figures, one of your cultist warriors or greater daemons, or you can play a card. Again, each of those will cost power, so you'll go around taking turns, doing one of those actions until everybody is out of power. Again, if you uh, have some power remaining but decide uh, you're done and don't want to do anything else, you just move your power marker on down to zero, and then you'll be skipped. Uh, other players that can still have power can continue taking turns until nobody has power left, and then that will end the summoning phase. Once the summoning phase is complete, you move on to the battle phase. In the battle phase, you'll resolve battles in each region in standard region order, which always starts with uh, Norska. And then you see there's these arrows that point to the next region that's resolved, which would be the troll country. Then this arrow points to Kislev. Then this arrow points to the Empire, which then has an arrow pointing to Bretonia, which has an arrow pointing to Astalia, which has an arrow pointing to Tilia, which has an arrow pointing to the Border Princes, 
which finally has an arrow pointing to the bad lens. So anything, anytime any card or anything says it's done in standard region order, that's the arrow, that's the order that it's done. So in the battle phase, you resolve any battles in standard region order. So Norska first. In this example, I've set up the only place we would have a battle is here in the Empire. You'll always have a battle in a region as long as at least one player is allowed to roll battle dice. Um, so that could happen even if, uh, here let me give an example, if uh, Nurgle had a figure here in Kislev, um, he can, because there's a peasant token there, there would be a battle there because peasants have a defense value of 1. Which means they can be uh, defeated with one hit, and if you defeat a peasant, you take it and put it in your on your power sheet um, or in your play area, and then some old world cards may give you uh, some effect for ha for those that you've collected. So, uh, for example, resolving this battle phase, we'll go ahead and see. Well, Nurgle has one of his plague bearers there. That's his warrior. It has one attack and one defense. So if it has one attack, that's the number of dice that it'll roll. So it'll roll one uh, die to attack that peasant. The peasant doesn't uh, have any dice to roll. So let me just grab this dice tray here and we'll roll on that. All right, so we'll say the Nurgle player rolls. Uh, so that's a miss. A hit is a four, five, or six. If you do get a six when you're rolling an attack, then that explodes and that counts as one hit and then you get to roll that dice again and then it could be an additional hit if it rolls a four five or six if it does roll another six then it explodes again so that would count for an additional hit and then you'd roll that dice again so um, in this case you know he rolls a four he would have a hit it only takes one hit to kill a peasant so he would take that and put it on his uh, sheet collect that peasant and then we'd move on to the next region now here we have some figures from all the players so each of them may get to roll dice you always start um, in standard player order so corn will roll his uh, dice first then followed by nurgle then zinch and then slanish but all players will get to roll even if their figures have been assigned hits so in this case uh corn has one warrior and two uh cultists well we can see that corn's cultists have an attack value of zero so they don't get to roll any dice but his warrior has an attack value of two so he gets to roll two dice so since he has uh, just one warrior, he gets to roll two, two battle dice. He rolls and gets a four and a five, so that's two hits. So he can assign those to opponents as he wishes. Um, the horror there has a defense of two, so it would take both hits to uh, kill that horror, whereas the acolytes... Um, for the zinch, the cultists for the zinch only take one hit to kill, and same for the cultists for the Nurgle player. So he could decide he wants to just kill the one uh, whore from the zinch player, or maybe uh, take out both of his cultists. So maybe that's what he decides uh, to do to, to assign. He got two hits, so he assigns one to the Nurgle cultist and one to the Zinch cultist. Now, you just tip them over, you don't remove them from the board, um, because if they were warrior figures or something that did have attack dice, they would still have the opportunity to attack. Um, in this case, they're not, they don't have any attack value, so it um, doesn't matter too much, but um, we would now go to the Nurgle player, it would be his chance to roll any attack dice, because he only had a cultist there which has no attack value he doesn't get to roll any dice so then we go to the zinch player who has two figures there he's got a, a warrior and a cultist his cultist has zero attack value but his uh, horror does have a one attack value so he gets to roll one dice 
So he would roll and he got a one, so that's a miss, so he doesn't get to assign any hits. So now that would end the battle. The corn figure, I mean, the, uh, these players would have to remove their um, figures from the board, place them back in their play area, and then we'd move on to the next region and do any battle that needs to take place there, all the way till you've um, resolved battles in all nine regions. And there may be cards, you know, if cards have been played to, to an area, they may affect battle. For instance, this one from the corn player says, at the beginning of battle in this region, you roll two battle dice here and apply any resulting hits before regular battle dice are rolled. So he would have got to roll two battle dice there. Um, and that could be placed, because you can place cards in any region that has a space available, even if you don't uh, have figures there. Um, if he had played this, you know, in a region like maybe he had played this here where there's only a Nurgle figure, he would still get to when the this region was being resolved for battle, the um, corn player would still get to roll two battle dice and apply the results before any regular battle dice are, are rolled. So even though he doesn't have a figure there, he could still possibly take out that Nurgle figure. Alright, so after the battle phase we move on to the corruption phase. Alright, in the corruption phase um, you'll do two things. You'll calculate domination and then after that you'll place corruption tokens and you do that again in standard region order so starting with Norska and moving so forth. So when you uh, calculate domination in a region, you each player summons the or totals the number of figures they have in that region, plus any uh, summoning points on cards they've played into that region, and that total is their dominance value or their domination value. And then the player with the highest domination value in that region compares that to the region's resistance value, which this is uh, the resistance value here. And if it is higher than the resistance value, then that player uh, immediately scores a number of victory points equal to the conquest value of that region, which is also this number. But that can be altered, for instance, a noble in a region increases the conquest value. So the conquest value in a, of this region would actually be 6. Its resistance value is still just 5, but its conquest value would be 6. So for example, there's no figures or cards in uh, the Norska region or the Troll Country region, but here in Kislev, the Nurgle player has one figure, so his dominance value is one compared to the resistance value in Kislev of three, so he doesn't dominate that, so he doesn't get any points. Now here, in the Empire, uh, the Zinch player has one figure plus a card with cost of one summoning, so he has a dominance value or domination value of two where the corn player has one, two, three figures, so he has a domination value of three. So he has the higher domination value, so he would compare his domination value against the resistance, which is five. It is not higher, so he would not score the conquest points. So then we would come to this region. Uh, the corn player just has one figure, so his domination value is just one. The Nurgle player has one, two, three figures, plus one uh, from this card he played, so he has a domination of value of four, which is higher than the resistance value of Bretonia. So he would um, immediately score the conquest value, which is three, so he would move his victory point marker up three spaces on the victory point track. And so you go through all uh, the regions where players have figures and score uh, whoever has domination there. And if, if it's higher than the resistance value, they uh, score that many, uh, the conquest value in victory points.
Now some effects may raise the resistance value, um, just like uh, the noble token here raises the um, conquest value. So once you've gone through and calculated uh, domination in each of the nine regions, now this is still in the corruption phase, then you'll go through each region in standard region order again. And for every region where a player has um, cultists, they will place corruption markers depending on the number of cultists they have. So here we see that the corn player has two cultists, so he would place two corruption markers in that region. Here we see that the Nurgle player has three cultists, so he would get to place three corruption uh, markers in that region. And the corn player has one cultist, so he would get to place one. Here the uh, Zinch player has one cultist, so he would get to place one of his corruption markers. Here in Tilia, he has two, the Zinch player has two cultists, so he would place two corruption markers, and so forth uh, for each region. Now, as you're placing corruption markers in these regions, um, depending on the number of cultists that players have in there, before you move to the next region to do the same, if after placing corruption markers in a region, that region has 12 or more corruption tokens in it, you know, totaling for all players, and these warp stones count as a corruption. So, for instance, this... Um, after this player placed his two corruption tokens in there, and because it has a one warp stone, this region, Tilia, now has a total of three corruption. If a region ever has a total of, um, after you've placed your um, corruption tokens in that region before you move to the next one to do the same, if that region has 12 or more corruption in it, then that region is ruined. So, for example, we'll say in this corruption phase, um, the corn, the I mean the Nurgle player placed one corruption there, um, and the uh, Zinch player placed two, and so now uh, Tilia has twelve corruption in it, four um, that have been placed over time from Nurgle, two from corn. One, two, three, four, five from Zinch and a warp stone. So this region is ruined. So the first thing you'll do is draw the top uh, ruination card from the stack, which um, they're in order. So the very first one drawn will be number one. You place that here in the middle of the region. Each player. Here you'll see at the top it says Ruiners score three points each. So each player that placed uh, Corruption in that region um, this round, or you know, during this Corruption phase, would score three points each. So in this case, Nurgle placed one and Zinch placed two, so they're the two Ruiners. So they would each score three points, so Nurgle would score three, one, two, three and Zeech would score one, two, three. And that's all you would do with that right now. Then you move on to the next region and place corruption tokens and so forth till you've gone through all the regions. And then that will finally end the corruption phase and then you move on to the end phase. So the first thing you do in the end phase is just all players will remove any uh, chaos cards they played to the board and put them in a discard pile. If your draw deck, chaos card draw deck ever runs out, you shuffle your discard pile and form a new draw deck. So again, first thing in the end phase, all players will remove their uh, chaos cards from the board and put them in a discard pile. Next, in the end phase, you go through in standard region order in any regions that have a hero token in them. These will be placed from various game effects. Any region that has a hero token in it, for each hero token, the player with the highest threat, so in this case we have Zinch and Corn, uh, both have uh, figures in there, 
corn has a threat of three, zinc has a threat of two. So the corn player, uh, the player with the highest threat, will have to choose and remove one figure in a region where there's a uh, hero token. So the corn player would have to choose one of his figures and remove it. So maybe he removes his warrior. If there were two hero tokens in there, then he would then have to move an remove another uh, figure from the board. So again, for in each region that has hero tokens, for each uh, hero token there, the player with the highest threat has to remove one figure from the board. Next, you resolve old world cards that say in the end phase. So in this case, this old world call card says in the end phase. When old world cards are resolved, remove all cultists from every region containing at least one event token. We did have one event token that got placed here. So all cultists would have to be removed um, from this region. So that would not be good for those players. Then move all event tokens in play to the region with the most corruption tokens. So you would then move uh, all event tokens, in this case just one, to the region with the most corruption tokens, which currently is this one. Next you'll score ruined regions. So for each region that was ruined, this round uh, you'll score those in standard region order in this case there's only one ruined region that was uh, ruined this round so you'll look at the region in this case it was tilia and you'll see that the player with the most corruption tokens in that region will score seven victory points the player with the second most uh, victory point tokens in that region, or not, the player with the most corruption tokens in that region would score seven. So in this case, that would be the Zinch player, so he would score seven victory points. The player with the next most uh, corruption tokens in the region, in this case, that would be Nurgle, he would score three victory points. Once those points have been awarded, then the card is turned face down that region is permanently ruined all corruption tokens are then taken off of that region and go back to their player supply like so and then again that room that region is permanently ruined when a region is permanently ruined um, like this then uh, chaos cards players cannot play chaos cards into that region um, old world cards that would place tokens um, would not tokens would not get placed in that region now that doesn't necessarily means that any current tokens in that region are removed but new tokens cannot be placed there although players can still have figures there and battles will take place there during the corruption phase, there's no domination checked for that, re for that region and no corruption tokens are placed in that region. But pretty much all other rules remain in effect for that region, so it's still adjacent. Players can still summon figures there. Um, battles can still occur there, but uh, basically you can't... Uh, place corruption there and won't get any points score any victory points uh, in the corruption phase there now i should probably mention when you're scoring the root ruined region for these points here um, by who has the most corruption uh, tokens and who has the second most corruption tokens in there if there's a tie for the most corruption tokens in there then you would just sum the first and second place total and divide it by the number of players uh, tied for most corruption tokens uh, rounded down and then just nobody would get any points for the second most if there's a tie for the second most then they just uh, the players tied for the second most split that second place amount of victory points uh, rounded down between the 
tied players. All right, so after you've scored Ruin Regions in the end phase, uh, the next thing you do is advance threat dials. Now, we hadn't talked about the threat dials yet, so we'll talk about those now. Each uh, Chaos God or Power has a dial advancement condition on their sheet. So, for instance, Corn he places a, a dial advancement counter on his dial each time he kills one or more enemy figures in the same region in the same phase. So during the battle phase, you know, he, the corn player killed um, a figure here. Um, so he should have taken one of these dial advancement counters and put it on his uh, dial advancement dial. So if, and then if he had killed um, at least one figure in an, in another region during the battle phase, then he would get to place another token. Uh, Zinch, he gets to place that one on there. He places a counter on his dial each uh, time he places two or more corruption tokens in a region with two or more magic symbols or warp stones. Well, we've talked about warp stones. Magic symbols are some of his cards have this... Um, symbol on it that's a magic symbol so he gets to place a dial advancement counter during the corruption phase when he's placing corruption um, if he places uh, two or more corruption in a region that has two or more magic symbols and or warp stones so either magic symbols for, if he had had you know one card in here with a magic symbol and because there's one warp stone that would count if he placed two uh, corruption, which he, he would have because he had two cultists, then he would have got to place a dial advancement counter on his dial. And Nurgle, he gets to place one. He places a counter on his dial each time he places two or more corruption tokens on a populous region. Some of the regions say populous here, so Estelia, Bretonia, the Empire, and Kislev. So anytime he places two or more corruption tokens in a populous region, then he gets to place a dial advancement token on his dial. So in the end phase, after you've scored ruined regions, then you advance the dials again in standard player order. So Corn first, and Nurgle, Zinch, Slanish. So everybody that has at least one uh, dial advancement token on their uh, dial gets to advance it one and it'll get like this one if you advance it it scores him four victory points if Nurgle got to advance his he scores three victory points so there's different but that's also how you'll get your upgrade cards like here if he had got to advance it again then he would get to choose one of his uh, five upgrade cards um, let's just look at those so like three of those are you know, upgrades for either your cultist or your warrior or your greater daemon and it gives you some little upgrade for that. If you choose one of those as your upgrade, you just place it, replace it on your power sheet like that. And then it has, so like this one gives his uh, cultist who normally had no attack value, it gives him one attack value. Um, so anyway, there's upgrades for that, or this one, uh, when you recover power points in the draw phase, you gain one power point more. So instead of going up to seven, he would get to move his back up to eight. And yeah, what's this other one for corn? You draw an additional chaos card in the draw phase. So uh, each of them has something similar with their upgrades. So, your dial advancement is how you get these upgrade cards. Now, even if you had three or four, like if Corn had killed figures in three or four different regions and he had three or four uh, dial advancement tokens on here, you still only, uh, for no matter how many tokens you have there, you only get to advance your dial once. Um, but then the player who had the most dial advancement tokens um, gets to advance one more time. So, for example, in this case, if Korn had two dial advancement tokens, Nurgle had one, and Zeech had three, they would each get to 
advance their dial one and then because Zinch had the most dial advancement tokens he would get to advance his one more then the dial advancement tokens are just removed All right, and then the final thing in the end phase is to check for game end. So these, these game end conditions are checked in order, and if one of them occurs, uh, the higher one in order is what will determine the order, the winner. So first you determine if anybody's dial advancement counter has reached the victory uh, step. So you'll notice if you turn these all the way around, finally it's going to get to where one of them says, you know, vic victory. So if somebody's dial advancement counter reached its victory uh, spot in that round, then that player immediately wins the game. If nobody's threat dial reached the victory uh, spot, then the next thing you check for game end is if somebody reached 50 or more victory points. If somebody reached 50 or more victory points, then they immediately win the game. All right, if nobody has reached that, then you check if five uh, regions have been ruined. If five re regions have been ruined, then the game will end and whoever is currently has the most victory points wins the game. And finally, if none of, those, none of those conditions have been met and there are no more cards to draw from the Old World deck, then the game ends and all the players lose. They were unable to corrupt the Old World, and so all the Chaos God powers lose the game. Now, uh, just to go back, if uh, two or more players, uh, both of their threat dials advance to the victory point in the round, then among those tied players whose threat dial bounced, advanced to the victory, uh, whichever one of them had the highest uh, amount of victory points would win. If, in the unlikely scenario, they were tied for victory points, then they would just uh, end in a tie. Um, if no player... Um, threat dial reached the victory point but more than one player uh, had their victory points go past 50 in a round then whichever one had the more the greater number of victory points would win the game if that was still a tie then whichever one of them had the greatest threat on the threat dial would uh, win the game if five regions were ruined um, and the victor had to be determined by whoever had the most victory points and uh, the players with the most victory points were tied, then again it would go to whoever has the highest threat on the threat dial would win the, the game. So that's it. I think we've pretty much covered all the rules. I'll set the game back up to how it was at the beginning and we'll go through an example round or two. All right, I think I have everything set back how it was right after I did setup. The threat dials are all back to start. I've got the tokens. All right, I think I've got everything back how it should be. So we start uh, with the old world phase where, again, the player with the lowest threat, who we know is Nurgle, but we can check that again. Zinch has two. Nurgle has one. And Corn has three, so he draws an old world card and resolves it. All right, place one token in each of two different regions, then place one hero token in each of two different regions, then place one noble token in each of two different regions. All right, and it's the Corn uh, player who's, I mean, the Nurgle player who's choosing this. So, all right, so place one peasant token in each of two different regions. So, uh, we'll say he's going to put one in here and one in here. Then place one hero token in each of two different regions. So, let me get two hero tokens. We'll put one here and maybe he'll put one here 
and then place one noble token in each of two different regions. So let me get two noble tokens. I'll put one here and one here. All right, and then it says uh, to discard this card instead of adding it to the old world track. So we'll just put it out of the game. All right, so that's the end of the old world phase. Now we go into the draw phase. We know that Corn draws two cards. We know that Nurgle draws two cards. And we know that Zinch draws up to six, and he can discard one first. He's not going to discard. I mean, he draws up to five, sorry. He has three. He'll draw two. All right. Um, and then we would also move our power tokens back up to their um, starting spots, but that's already done since it's the first round of the game. Okay, that's the end of the draw phase. Now we go to the summoning phase. All right, we do that in standard player order, Corn, Nurgle, and Zinch. All right, so Corn, he's going to summon a... He's, so, he's going to spend one, and he's going to summon a... Uh, cultist, blood sworn cultist uh, to Bretonia. No, I think he's going to go to the Empire. All right, that's his turn. Come to Nurgle. And before I go to Nurgle, remember uh, he could summon that to that location because when you have no figures on the board, you can put your first figure in any region on the board. All right, so Nurgle, I think he's going to summon a cultist too. He's going to do that here in the border princes, and that will cost him one. Now, again, to the summoning cost is shown here. So for one of his cultists is one, and for uh, when Corn summoned his cultist, that costs one also. All right, now we go on to Zinch. And I think he's going to follow what the other guys are doing. He's going to summon one of his Cultus and Acolyte into uh, Estalia, and that's going to cost him one. And now we go back to Corn. Well, we know Corn wants to do battle so he can kill people and get his, because that's his dial advancement condition. So he's going to summon one of his uh, Blood Letter Warriors that costs two. One, two. And he's going to summon it. He can summon it in the same region he already has a figure or an adjacent one. The Border Princess is adjacent to the Empire where he already has a figure. So he's going to summon one of his blood letters here into the Border Princess. And that costs two, which I already moved down the power track. All right, going to Nurgle. Well, Nurgle knows he's probably going to have to battle here. So maybe he wants to summon one of his... Plague Bearers, or maybe his even his Great Unclean one. So maybe he's going to do that. So he's going to spend three, one, two, three, to summon his Great Unclean one um, to the Border Princes. And he can do that because he already has one figure there. Zinch, he's going to try to stay out of that mess, and he's just going to summon another one of his Acolyte Cultists for one. And he's going to summon that into Estalia. Alright, back to Corn. He's going to play this uh, Chaos card at the beginning of battle in this region. You roll two battle dice here and apply any results before regular battle. And he's going to play that here in the Border Princes. Because he's hoping he can maybe uh, get rid of some figures here before a regular battle. And that had a zero cost to play, so he does not have to lower his uh, power at all. Alright, so now we're back to Nurgle's turn. Nurgle, he's just going to spend one to uh, summon... He's going to summon a cultist... Uh, Gosh, I guess he'll summon another one here to the Border Princes. Alright, we're back to Zinch. He's going to play this card uh, for a cost of one. 
the cost for your opponents to summon figures <clears throat> excuse me to this region and play chaos cards to this region is increased by two he's going to play that there and it has a magic symbol on it all right back to corn he's going to pay one just to summon another cultist uh, here in Bretonia. now he can do that because it's adjacent uh, to where he already has a figure it's actually adjacent to two places that he already has a figure and Nurgle has one point left to spend. I think he's going to summon one of his cultists, uh, his lepers, uh, here to the Badlands. That's adjacent to the Border Princes, so he can do that. And that will cost him his last point. So he's out. He'll be skipped. Zinch and Corn still have quite a few left. All right, so we'll say Zinch is going to spend one, and he's going to summon a cultist to Telia. He can do that because it's adjacent to Astalia where he already has um, a figure. Corn is going to spend two to summon a blood letter. It costs two uh, for one of his blood letter warriors and he's going to summon that here into Bretonia. He can do that because he already has a figure. Remember, Nurgle is skipped because he's already at zero, so now we come back to Zinch. Alright, uh, Zinch, he's going to spend another one to summon another cultist into Telia. Or Telea, however you say it. Alright, Corn, he's going to spend his, his last power point to play this card into Bretonia. When adding your domination value in this region, count the sum of your figure's attack values rather than your quantity of figures. Remember, normally you add the quantity of figures instead of their attack values. Um, and add the cost of your chaos cards, cards in normal. So he's going to play that into Bretonia. And that's going to be his last power point. So now we go back to Zinch. He's the only one with power left. Zinch is going to play this card, which costs zero, and he's just going to play that into Talea. And it's just the text effects of other all, all other chaos cards in this region are canceled, which there's none other there. But it does have a magic icon, which he wants to get into play, so that's why he's playing it. And he still has one point left, so I think he'll spend that to summon another cultist uh, here into Astalia. Alright, so now everybody is out of power points, so we'll move on to the battle phase. Alright, so we resolve that in standard region order. There isn't anything to battle until uh, here. Now, this figure could battle this peasant if he had any attack value but he's a cultist and he currently has no attack value when he's upgraded he will but he doesn't now so no battle there um, we can have a battle here because corn uh, has a warrior there and there's a peasant token there so corn will roll to see if he can defeat that peasant token his blood letters have an attack value of two so he'll get two dice and he did get one hit. Remember, four, five, or six is a hit. So that's all he needs to defeat this peasant. He'll take that and put it on his sheet. All right, so now we move to Astalia. There is a peasant token in there, but Sinch doesn't have a figure that is allowed to roll any dice. His lepers, cultists, don't have any attack value, so no battle there. We come here to Talea. No battle there as well. Now we are at the Border Princes where we will have a battle because both Corn and Nurgle have uh, units that can roll dice. So Corn will go first. When you roll the dice, you always go in standard player order. And also we have this that Corn put at the beginning of the battle. You'll roll two battle dice here and apply results before regular battle. So he'll do that first. He'll roll his two battle dice. He got two hits. Unfortunately, he can't kill the uh, 
the great old one with just two hits it has a defense of three he could go ahead and take out the uh, two cultists if he wanted to but what he can do is save those two hits and then go ahead and use them in addition to uh, his regular battle roll which he's going to get to roll two more dice two more attack dice for a regular battle roll with his blood letter so if he gets another hit then along with the two hits he already has he can take out that great gold one which is what he wants to do probably it may be better to take out the the uh, two cultists um, before regular battle uh, no he's gonna say he's gonna save those two hits and now he's gonna roll this so now we're having the regular battle uh, roll um, so he gets to roll the two dice for that figure he did get a hit so that's gonna give him three hits the two he got from rolling for this card plus the one he got there so he can tip this figure over it takes three to take it out and that's what he rolled and now uh, the Nurgle figure gets to roll, uh, Nurgle player gets to roll, he gets zero for his cultist, um, but his uh, great unclean one does get to roll three attack dice. He got uh, a six which explodes, so that gives him one hit and he gets to roll it again, and he got a five, so that's two hits which it only takes one hit to take out a, a bloodletter warrior anyway so he gets to kill him so this is eliminated so corn uh, killed a figure in a battle so he gets to put a, uh, a dial advancement token on his dial um, but then his figure was killed by the Nurgle all right, so that's battle taken care of in that region. And finally here, uh, there's no battle because there's only a cultist which can't roll any dice. All right, that's going to end the battle phase. Now we go on to the corruption phase. So again, we do that in standard region order. Um, so the first one we have to come to is here, where Korn, has, he adds a total of his cards and number of figures um, so he only has a dominance value of one against the resistance of five so he's he's not going to be able to uh, get the conquest value there we come to this region now remember he played this card when adding up your domination value count the sum of, of your uh, your figures attack values rather than the quantity of figures uh, I don't think that's going to work out too well because the attack value of his cultist is zero. The attack value of this guy is two. So um, it's going to work out the same either way. He either, well, he does get the one for this card. So that gives him two plus one for the card. So his dominance value is three, but that only ties. It doesn't exceed the resistance value. So he doesn't get the conquest value there. So we move on to Estalia. Now Zinch gets uh, his dominance value is one, two, three, four, which is only equal. So again, he still doesn't have a higher uh, dominance value than the resistance. So he doesn't get any uh, conquest points. We move on here to Talia or Tilia, and he has one, two against two. So again, it's not higher. So nobody gets any points there. We come here to the border princes. Now here we do, uh, Nurgle has won two points. The resistance is only one, so he does uh, have a higher dominance value. So he gets the conquest points, which is also one. So he gets one victory point. And then in this one, uh, he has one figure against a resistance of one, so that's a tie, not exceed, so he doesn't get any conquest points there. Alright, now we go on to where we place corruption tokens. 
Um, again, in region order, so the first one, Corn has one cultist here, so he gets to place one corruption token. Corn has one cultist here, so he gets to place one corruption token. Zinch has three cultists here, so he gets to place three corruption tokens in there. And also, his dial advancement condition is place a counter uh, on your dial each time you place two or more corruption in a region with two or more magic symbols and or warp stone tokens. So he, he has one warp stone token and one magic symbol, so that's two and he placed two or more corruption so he gets to place a dial advancement counter on his threat dial alright now we come to Talea he gets to place two corruption tokens there and also there's a warp token and a magic symbol so again he met his condition again so he gets to place another uh, dial advancement counter on his threat dial Right on to the border princes. Nurgle has two cultists there, so he gets to place two corruption um, in there. And finally, in the Badlands, Nurgle has one cur uh, cultist, so he gets to place one corruption. Now, as we were going through, you know, every time you place the corruption uh, in this phase, you check if there's 12 or more corruption. Uh, to see if it's ruined, but I knew none of them are even close to having 12 or more corruption at this point. That'll occur a few rounds into the game. Um, but anyway, that'll end the corruption phase. Now we go to the end phase. So first we remove all our uh, chaos cards. So those will just go into a discard. Those will go into a discard. And I think that's all the chaos cards. All right. Next, we uh, resolve hero tokens. Uh, there's, there is a hero token here, but there's no figures. There is a hero token here. Corn's the only player in there. It would, it would normally be the player with the highest threat with a figure in there has to remove uh, one of their figures since Corn is the only one in there. He has the highest threat, so he's got to remove one of his figures because of this hero token. He will remove his cultist. Put that back in his area. No other hero tokens on the board, so that's resolved all the hero tokens. Um, now we resolve any old world cards on the track. There aren't any. The one that we uh, turned over at the first part of the round just got discarded. It didn't go onto the track. And now we go to, uh, we would score any ruined regions, but we don't have any that are ruined. So now we go on to advance the threat dials. Um, Korn got one dial advancement token, and Zinch got two. Nurgle didn't get any. So Korn's going to get to advance his dial. So he gets, score four, gets to score four victory points. So he goes down there to four. Now, Zinch, because he got the most uh, dial advancement tokens, he's going to get to, he gets to advance at once for having dial advancement token, and then an additional one because he has the most dial advancement tokens. Now, happens he just had two, but even if he had like three or four, he would still only get to advance it, you know, twice, once for having tokens and once for having the most. All right, so he'll advance the first time. He gets to place a warp stone token. So uh, we'll say he's gonna place it in there, and then he gets to advance one more time, and he gets to choose an upgrade card. So I think he's gonna uh, take this upgrade card that for his greater daemon and what it upgrades is when uh, a Lord of Change, uh, wherever the Lord of Change is, it's considered to have two magic symbols. And, you know, and he needs those for his dial advancement. So that's his upgrade. And again, Nurgle didn't get any. And then we would check for game end, which we know is not now. None of the uh, threat dials are at um, 
victory. Nobody's even close to having 50 or more victory points. There's no ruin. We certainly don't have five ruined regions, and there are still old world cards to draw from, so there's no game in. So now we would start the next round. Again, with the old world phase, the person with the lowest threat, which is still Nurgle, would turn over the top old world card and do whatever it says. So I think that's that's enough. Um, We've gone ahead and gone through a full round. There's not a whole lot that uh, happened, you know, in the first round of the game. There's, we didn't ruin any regions or anything like that. But <clears throat> you can see as the rounds go by and you get more figures on the board, more corruption out. There's a lot more going on as the game goes on. But still, it doesn't take it a long time to play this game. I'd say uh, it's probably about 30 minutes to pl uh, per player, so in a three-player game, about an hour and a half, probably. Um, anyway, like I said, I hadn't played this game with other people since uh, 2012, which I'm not sure why it's been so long, because I, I really like this game. Um, and I think, you know, the people that I've played it with liked it, too. I know this game... Um, after it came out a couple years later they redid the box cover uh, the one i showed at the beginning of this video they changed it to a different image as far as i know the rest of the gameplay remained the same but i don't think it's available anymore i think uh, fantasy flight games lost the warhammer license so they weren't able to create this game anymore but uh, you could probably find a used copy of it out there somewhere if this looks interesting to you I think it's a good game um, a lot of fun a lot of interaction once you get uh, you know a few rounds in and uh, I think it was I think I've played it with three and four players I think it was better with four once you have all the players out there but it's still fun with three anyway this video has gone on pretty long I'm gonna wrap it up uh, thanks for watching I hope you enjoyed it